thank you for tuning in. Uh, this is actually a, a fourth section of the CCG 8 China Globalization Forum and uh, actually followed the dialogue with uh, former Secretary, uh, Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson this morning and Ambassador Roundtable this morning too and, and China European Roundtable uh, this afternoon. So I hope you all enjoyed the forum discussion so far. Uh, you are now watching the forum special online program History at a Turning Point Pandemic, Ukraine and the Changing Relation between China, Europe and the United States. Dialogue with historian Neil Fox. I would like to introduce our uh, uh, speaker, Neil Fox, today. Uh, Professor Neil Fox is the Milbank Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, Stanford University, and a senior fellow at the Belfast Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard, where he served for 12 years as the Lawrence Tisch Professor of History. He's the author of 16 books, many of them are award-winning and international bestsellers. He has won numerous books, prizes, an accomplished biography. He is currently writing The Life of Harry Kissinger, the first volume of which we published uh, in 20, uh, actually published in 2015, and uh, uh, also got a very <coughs> critical uh, acclaim as a Kissinger, 1923-1968. Uh, uh, the idealist of the book won the 26th Council of Foreign Relations Arthur, Arthur Ross Book Award. So in 2011, his film festival prize for the best documentary. Professor Fogsen is the uh, Philip Rome Visiting Professor at the London School of Economics in 2010-11 and a Visiting Professor at the Tsinghua University School of Economics and Management 2016-2021. So, a uh, well-known professor uh, around the world. He has uh, received honorary degrees from the University of Buckingham, uh, Macquarie University of Australia, and University, Uni University of Oslo, Chile. And uh, he's trustee of the New York Historical Society and the London Bay Center for Policy Studies. Time Magazine named him one of the 100 most influential people in the world. With 2022, we have entered the third year of the COVID-19 pandemic that has prompted many to pronounce the end of globalization. Amongst Washington drive to decouple from China economically and technologically, the Ukraine conflict has produced a rupture in the global energy and food supply chains, as well as the European uh, balance of power. So from uh, the globalist elite at Davos to populist at the ballot box. People from all corners of the world are grappling with the key issues in a great power relation between China, America, and Europe, and global implications. So with the outcome of Russian invasion of Ukraine yet to come, how can we use history to help inform and illuminate the present, the present and uh, uh, present the, the choices and the challenges facing the world? This program features Professor Neil Fixin, one of the most brilliant historians of our age, and his insight on the key issues of the day. So without further ado, let's start with our esteemed speaker, who is to join us uh, from London. Hi, Neil, how are you? Uh, great to have you. So maybe you can have your opening remarks. Thanks Neil, for joining us. Oh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Henry. It's a pleasure to uh, join this group. It's a critical time in history in so many different respects. I thought it might make sense uh, just to reflect on uh, the non-transitory nature of, of the crises we face. Transitory is a, a word that appeals uh, to many people. Uh, it's usually mentioned in connection with inflation. Uh, when inflation uh, leapt upwards uh, this year, uh, many economists argued, including economists at the Federal Reserve, that it was just transitory. And of course, uh, that turned out to be very wrong. And the predictions that Larry Summers and others uh, made last year that inflation was going to uh, surge up to levels we haven't seen since the early 1980s proved to be right. Uh, 
inflation, in other words, uh, turned out not to be transitory. And I don't think it's going to go away in the way that the central banks uh, forecast. A lot of people thought the war in Ukraine uh, would be transitory too. Uh, there were people who published articles at the beginning of the war in late February uh, suggesting that it would be over very quickly uh, because uh, Russia would uh, swiftly take control of Kyiv and overthrow the Ukrainian government. Uh, when that didn't happen, there were others who argued that Ukraine was going to win the war uh, almost as quickly. And uh, here we are, uh, it's, uh, it's June and there is no end in sight. So that war turned out not to be transitory and it's hard to know at just when it will end. And finally, of course, there's COVID-19, the pandemic that uh, has now uh, been going for uh, close to two and a half years. And anybody who tells you that it's over and that we're in the post-pandemic era isn't looking at the data where new variants uh, continue to manifest themselves and case numbers, hospitalization numbers and death numbers are going up. Uh, this very week in many countries. So I think uh, the broad observation I would make is that in our time, we suffer from an attention deficit disorder. We want the news cycle to be two or three weeks, and then we get something new to think about. But history doesn't provide such short-lived events. Uh, and in each case, the economic shock, the geopolitical shock, and the public health shock uh, the event is lasting longer than people were expecting. And indeed, uh, each of these problems, the problem of inflation, the problem of war, and the problem of the pandemic, don't actually seem likely, uh, in my view, to stop anytime soon, and may indeed start to feel like permanent features uh, of life over the coming years. So that's my uh, introductory uh, observation. But for the sake of, of dialogue, let me stop there and uh, and throw the ball back to you, Henry. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you, Neil. Yeah, uh, uh, great uh, uh, for, uh, for, the, for your opening remark. I mean, you are, you are really such a, a, a great historian and has been you know, watching the history unfolding uh, in many uh, aspects. And I also uh, I read your recent uh, articles on, in Bloomberg as well. But let's maybe still concentrate a bit on the on the on this pandemic. And uh, uh, as we know that uh, you, your latest book, uh, the, the, the Boom, The Politics of Catastrophe, argues that disasters are often consequences of man-made social and economic factors and of political decisions. You know that we are still come back to COVID-19. And of course, the worldwide you know, virus has claimed many, many lives. And uh, so, uh, what, as a historian, you, you look at this for, certainly in the long term. Uh, so th does the pandemic teach us in terms of international relations? I mean, in which ways the COVID-19 have changed the dynamic of global co cooperation and also the lessons we can draw from the past. So, uh, and this is, you know, pandemic, but also on top of that, we have, you know, we have this uh, Ukraine war, we have this uh, uh, also, uh, you know, energy crisis, we have this uh, food crisis, uh, all, and also the high inflation. Uh, I, I saw you also uh, interviewed together with Larry Summers at uh, Bloomberg. Uh, I mean, he talked about this uh, uh, inflation that uh, has been really uh, uh, driving at all time high. So, so I, I, I hope that uh, you know you look at history, look at uh, 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 you know what can be unfold in the, in the years to come. And also, you mentioned about uh, uh, the Cold War in the past as well. So there are so many factors, you know, added up, and uh, we are probably at the crossroads for the mankind. And how can we steer through uh, this kind of a, a, a mad, you know, chaotic situation? Uh, you know, we need wisdom. We need to look at the history, and you probably uh, can give us uh, some hint on that. I think the first thing to realize is that one thing leads to another, one crisis leads to another, sometimes to more than one other crisis. And this uh, creates a kind of cascade or, or avalanche, which 
takes uh, people by surprise. Uh, many people, uh, when the pandemic uh, first began in early 2020, uh, didn't appreciate the enormous economic consequences of the non-pharmaceutical interventions, the lockdowns that were recommended by epidemiologists and public health experts. That huge economic shock in early 2020 then led to massive fiscal and monetary measures to offset uh, the costs of lockdowns. Uh, but these in turn had the uh, inflationary consequence by 2021 when vaccines became available and the need for drastic lockdowns, in, at least in the Western world, diminished. Of course, sometimes disasters are unrelated to one another. I don't think one could claim that the Russian invasion of Ukraine was connected in any way to the pandemic. The reality is that history in many ways is just one disaster after another, and you don't really have any way of predicting what disaster will strike next. Interestingly, many people prior to 2020 thought that the problem of pandemics had been solved. My old friend, uh, the Harvard psychologist Steve Pinker, wrote in uh, his book, Enlightenment Now, that the, there really wouldn't be another pandemic because we had got so good at medical science and at public health. And I felt strongly uh, that that was too optimistic a view and that there was going to be at some point uh, a new kind of respiratory disease, a new kind of virus against which we wouldn't be well protected. Now, compared with the distant past, compared with, for example, the 14th century, when the Black Death swept uh, across the Eurasian landmass, uh, we've made tremendous advances, not only in terms of medical science, but in terms of international cooperation uh, between governments, between uh, public health agencies. And much of that progress happened in the 19th and the 20th centuries. It was fitful. Uh, of course, it was uh, far from a perfect system. But the World Health Organization by the late 20th century certainly represented the best achievement in international public health cooperation in all of history. So the big question becomes, why did our system perform much worse? than it should have when uh, COVID-19 manifested itself uh, in, uh, in early 2020. And I don't think we have great answers to that question yet, partly because I don't think there's been a thorough inquiry into the origins of the pandemic, uh, not only in China, but globally. We also don't have, I think, nearly enough uh, of, a, of an inquiry into why national public health systems did badly. The American public health system was supposed to be the best prepared in the world uh, for a pandemic, and it turned out to perform really poorly with uh, an, excess, an excess of a million deaths attributable to COVID. So I think the puzzle of 2020 and 2021 is that uh, our international systems and our national systems did much worse than one would have expected uh, on the eve of the pandemic. And I think it's extremely important that around the world, we really do dig into the causes of this disaster, because clearly this isn't the last uh, pandemic. There'll, there'll be, no doubt, uh, in addition to new variants of COVID, there'll be some other form of, of infectious disease at some point uh, in the foreseeable future. Because in the end, globalization, for all its benefits, created a vulnerability. And that vulnerability was that there had never been more international travel. There had never been such large volumes of people crossing borders at high speeds. Uh, and therefore, we were highly vulnerable to any new infectious disease. That, I think, is the big lesson. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Leo. Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, how the human beings can work together and, uh, and really internationally with this uh, 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 dynamic of the uh, flow of the of the people, uh, uh, unprecedented flow of people, uh, travelers uh, uh, around the world. I mean, this this kind of a, a pandemic, a future pandemic, uh, uh, really has to be dealt internationally, collectively, with some uh, 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 multi multilateral 
uh, 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 you know, a mechanism. That, that's absolutely important. Uh, you know, we, we, we had the pandemic. I mean, you, you mentioned that it's, it's really, uh, uh, you know, devastating and also we don't know, you know, what's new coming up and then we haven't found out what's really happened in the past. So, so we, we have to really uh, cope for the, for the future uncertainty. But then the war is really at a, at a uh, you know, dangerous uh, uh, phase now. Now we are having this uh, Ukraine-Russian uh, conflict uh, going on. I mean, uh, you know, this is a probably a man-made uh, catastrophe. And, uh, and also this has actually uh, ushering a, a new era as well, uh, uh, you know, post and, uh, and before we, we were totally different. Uh, so what do you think about this, uh, you know, you call this historical energy you have actually drawn in your recent article of, of, about 1970s, the avalanche of the history, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the collapse of the, of, of, of the history. And uh, so in terms of this economic and geopolitical shocks, uh, that's happening and, uh, and, and it's actually made the world more dangerous. Uh, what, is, what is your uh, take on, on, on the current situation and what do you see the end of that? I mean, also now, even though Russia is confronting, uh, Ukraine confronting probably the indirect NATO, and, but then, you know, we know that uh, the, uh, uh, the US government and probably, uh, you know, is really aiming at the China in, in a larger contest. And uh, we see the recent visit of the, uh, President Biden to, to 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 Asia and then set up uh, the IP, e, IPEF and also Quad and the, all the systems. So 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 also I saw your your uh, your article in the in the uh, the Bloomberg talk about uh, Dante uh, you know uh, that uh, appeasement. Uh, you know maybe you know we should probably look at the wisdom and what has been happened in, in the Cold War experience of. Uh, uh, you know, 1950s and the 70s, you know, so, so uh, what, what hasn't happened in the 1930s and what has happened in the 1970s, you draw a very uh, interesting comparison there. And uh, so maybe you can elaborate about your, your, uh, those ideas and uh, let, let Chinese uh, 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 viewers know uh, what, what is uh, your you know, key message at the Bloomberg uh, article, which is very, very interesting. Well, I think it's important to try to begin by understanding what exactly is, is happening in Ukraine, because I think a good deal of confusion has arisen. Uh, I've been to Ukraine many times. I've visited the country almost every year for the last 10 years. And it's been obvious to me for some time uh, that Ukraine was in a very vulnerable position uh, for two reasons. Firstly, uh, President Vladimir Putin clearly did not accept uh, Ukraine's move uh, westwards, uh, not only uh, with the discussion of potential NATO membership, but also the discussion of European Union membership. In his eyes, uh, Ukraine was a historic uh, part of the Russian Empire, and he consistently questioned the legitimacy of uh, a Ukraine that effectively decoupled uh, from Russia and became integrated into the West. That was why in 2014, uh, Russia annexed Crimea and sent uh, uh, forces into eastern Ukraine to help separatists establish control of Donetsk and, and Luhansk. Uh, it was in response to a political crisis in Ukraine when the then president uh, Yanukovych turned away from the possibility of European uh, negotiations uh, and triggered a revolution, uh, which in turn led to uh, the Russian intervention. So this story goes back uh, years, uh, not just to 2014, but even further back to 2008, when the idea of NATO membership for Ukraine was first discussed. At the same time, I think it's clear that uh, the West uh, offered Ukraine the worst of both worlds. It offered the possibility of NATO membership, uh, which clearly was regarded by Russia as unacceptable, but it didn't deliver on that promise. So Ukraine had uh, the prospect of NATO membership, but never. And that was really, I thought, the worst possible combination 
And I agreed with uh, Henry Kissinger when he argued in 2014 that it would be better to take NATO membership off the table and construct an alternative security arrangement for Ukraine on the basis of neutrality. Ultimately, I think the West failed to, to provide sufficient support for Ukraine uh, in recent years to deter Russia from an invasion. There were significant arms shipments uh, to Ukraine, but they fell away after 2018. And uh, it seems to me that one of the lessons here is that uh, if you're not capable of making a country like Ukraine well enough armed to deter an invasion, then an invasion is quite likely to happen. I think now uh, the West, led by the United States, has committed itself uh, to preventing Ukraine from losing the war. But it's not clear to me what exactly that looks like. Uh, we are, have now entered a new phase of the war. Uh, Russia failed to capture the capital, Kyiv, and is now engaged in a war of attrition in the Donbass region. But from where I'm sitting, it looks as if Russia is, is winning that war, uh, partly because of the very heavy casualties that Ukraine is suffering in this artillery war of attrition. So I think there's a very urgent need to think of ways to end this conflict before Ukraine is uh, permanently and, uh, and seriously damaged uh, as an economy. Uh, I don't think it can be in the interests of the Ukrainian people for this war to go on interminably. And uh, unfortunately, there's every sign, uh, at least from uh, where I'm sitting, that the war can drag on through the summer and, uh, and even into uh, the autumn and winter, at which point Russia's leverage over the European countries grows because uh, the full cost of sanctions, the full cost of cutting off uh, Russian gas and oil from Europe will become apparent when winter comes. The last thing I want to focus on, though, uh, is the, the role of China in this crisis, which I think is crucial in two ways. First, let me be clear, I can't believe that President Putin would have gone ahead uh, without at least tacit, if not explicit, uh, approval uh, from uh, the Chinese uh, leadership. And this is a, an, an extremely unfortunate aspect of the crisis. The second point is that in response, uh, the Biden administration seems to see the war in Ukraine primarily in terms of its relationship with China. There are clearly people in Washington who uh, see their support for Ukraine as a signal to Beijing, uh, see Ukraine in effect uh, as a proxy uh, in what I've called Cold War II. And the goal of, of US policy in the eyes of at least some members of the administration is to deter China from taking uh, military action with respect to Taiwan. In my view, uh, the strategy is a dangerous one in uh, two ways. First of all, it's not clear to me that it works. Uh, extending the war causes all kinds of disruption, including creating an inflation problem for the world, I don't think it really has a significant impact on the way the Chinese government thinks about the Taiwan question. Secondly, I think it's extremely dangerous for the United States and China to go down a collision course uh, over the question of Taiwan. If this is Cold War II, which I believe it is, with China, as it were, taking the place of the Soviet Union, then the Ukraine war is equivalent to the Korean War in 1950. And the next stage in Cold War II would be an equivalent to the, to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, remember, in 1962, the world came extremely close to World War III over an island. Uh, and I think we would be running a very similar risk if there were a US-China confrontation uh, over the island of, of Taiwan. So my argument is let's learn uh, a lesson from the first Cold War. And the lesson is that detente uh, is better than confrontation. Uh, and I would argue that it would be preferable to fast forward and avoid the Cuban Missile Crisis in our time uh, and go straight to detente, accelerate the Cold War cycle, as it were, and get more quickly to a period when the two superpowers focus on reducing tension uh, slowing down uh, the arms race 
and avoiding the kind of confrontation that would carry with it the risk of World War III. Apologies, Henry, that was a very long answer, but this is an extremely important point in my mind. And it's one that I'm trying my best to communicate, uh, not only uh, to uh, people in Washington, but also, I hope, to people in Beijing. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for your analysis. I, I think uh, you have given a very uh, clear, uh, your perspective about how this Ukraine will uh, come along, which I think uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, valuable lessons to be learned. And also you analyze the current situation uh, of, uh, uh, you know, where, what's the danger of that maybe leading to a, a cold war. Uh, I, I have one disagreement is that I, I'm, I'm not sure <laughs> that the uh, China leadership would probably know this beforehand because at that time, when President uh, Biden and President Xi had a, a virtual summit, uh, we had all the good words from President Biden, but the moment he went back, he said, we're going to boycott the Beijing Olympic. And then suddenly the Russian comes out, Putin said, okay, I'm coming, I'm going to support big way and uh, I'll be the make major power to attend Beijing Olympics. So, so I think there's something uh, uh, reciprocal that uh, China always have all kind of statement, a friendship, uh, memorandum. And so, so I, I, I don't think we were really uh, aware because uh, Chinese, you know, China was the last to pull out its uh, patriot from uh, Kiev. You know, we're almost uh, getting some people killed there. They, they, if they knew there was a serious attack like that, they would probably put them out uh, the earliest. So, 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 but, but other than that, I think your argument that also make a lot of sense is that this actually is, is a Cold War coming up. And, you know, even though Russia is involved, there could be more, uh, uh, you know, targeted by the US, like what we see from recent uh, US administration, uh, also uh, Secretary Blinken's uh, uh, speech lately that uh, they have to, uh, they invest, they have to align, and then they have to compete with China. So, so you see that kind of a, a framework that uh, that they are building right now. But, but you are right. You know, you talk about uh, the Tante. You know that that's really a great war. I mean, we should really revisit the wisdom of that. Uh, you know, by uh, President Reagan, who, who does that with Gorbachev, and uh, and uh, and uh, and now I think Biden probably in a in a in a, in a very uh, I mean, we don't see many time. There's, there's a midterm election coming up. Uh, Democrats probably is facing a huge uh, challenge, may lose uh, uh, both majorities. And, uh, and also that, uh, uh, you know, this, this channel tariff has contributed significantly to the, uh, uh, you know, the US inflation, you know, according to some think tank that could be probably cost two to 3%. Uh, so, so this trade war doesn't really make sense. And you are right, you know, Taiwan is really a, 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 a hot spot probably if we're not careful. And uh, as you said, the Cuba missile crisis almost lead us to the third world war. So, so those historical lessons, you, 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 you as a great historian has reminded the, uh, you know, people from East and West of all those uh, uh, dangerous outcome. And, and actually you, you are the bar, autobiography of, of, of uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger, and he has said we are at the foothill of, of the Cold War. Uh, so, so, so how do you think we can really get out of this uh, dangerous situation, uh, or maybe a Cold War 2.0? And uh, where do you see the, uh, uh, you know, the, the China, <laughs> US, and EU uh, to some extent that uh, we can really, you know. Safeguard multilateral system. Find a way to, you know, peacefully coexist. Of course, we have differences. We have values uh, uh, differences. We have a different uh, uh, running uh, government system. But let's not really get into a, a, a conflict. I saw recently the Chinese Defense Minister uh, answered the eleven questions at the Shanghai Dialogue, and also he met uh, uh, six counterparts in different countries. So, so we see some high level dialogue now. Uh, 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 you know, Chinese uh, top diplomat Yang Jiet also meet uh, Jack Sullivan lately. Uh, so, so what do you see how China and US can really uh, getting out of this, uh, you know, very dangerous uh, 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 trend that uh, as, as uh, uh, you are so familiar with, uh, with uh, the, those situation and also sitting in the UK to look at both sides. Well, I think the, the lesson of history is that and this was an argument my old friend Graham Allison made uh, several years ago, uh, is that 
a rising power and an established power are quite likely to come into conflict. Uh, this is one of uh, the, the patterns of history. Uh, and the interesting thing about the relationship between the US and China is that it went through a period of being relatively harmonious and uh, cooperative, the era of what I called Chimerica. Uh, but then quite quickly, uh, Chimerica, the partnership between the US and China, which was mainly economic in its nature, uh, began to crumble and was replaced by something that looked and sounded a lot like a Cold War. Now, when I first made this argument in 2018, not everyone agreed, but this was partly because they'd forgotten the true nature of the first Cold War. Uh, the, the true nature of a Cold War, as George Orwell said in 1945, is that it is a peace that is no peace. There isn't an outright world war, but the two superpowers engage in all kinds of indirect uh, conflict. Uh, the arms race was the most obvious example of the first Cold War, uh, the nuclear arms race, but there was also a space race. A Cold War is a technological competition, but it's also an ideological competition. And then it has, in addition, uh, classic territorial aspects where the two superpowers seek to have spheres of influence uh, or reach far abroad in search of support. So if one compares Cold War I with our present situation, the truth is that we now have most of the characteristics of a Cold War. Uh, and I think it's, it's important for both sides to recognize this. Part of what made the first Cold War dangerous was that there was no precedent. And I don't think people fully understood the risks that were being run uh, in the early phase of the Cold War. The Korean War was a very risky moment. Uh, there were serious debates about whether nuclear weapons should be used against China by the United States. In the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, a Soviet submarine came very close indeed to firing a nuclear torpedo uh, at American uh, naval vessels, which re really would have triggered uh, a, a world war. So the lesson of history is when you're in a Cold War, it's good to recognize that and not be in denial about it. And it's also good to recognize that Cold War is better than World War III. Uh, the most important thing is to manage the relationship, manage the technological competition, manage the ideological competition to avoid escalation to outright world war. That's the critical lesson, I think, uh, of the first Cold War. And if you ask how that was done, then I think you have to give some credit, indeed quite a lot of credit, uh, to Henry Kissinger and the presidents that he served, Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford, who did a great deal to uh, relax relations with the Soviet Union. Uh, and of course, uh, began that process of building a diplomatic relationship between the United States and China, beginning with Kissinger's uh, secret trip to Beijing in 1971 and Richard Nixon's visit to China 50 years ago. Now, from my vantage point, uh, I would far rather that we tried to revive some of that spirit of détente, uh, the term that was used in the 1970s, because it seems to me that the alternative is an increasingly uh, competitive, combative, uh, and ultimately uh, conflict-oriented uh, relationship, which will have more than one flashpoint. It's not just about Taiwan, it's also about the South China Sea, Listening to Anthony Blinken's recent speech, almost every issue was mentioned in that speech, including Hong Kong and Xinjiang. The administration seems to be on a collision course. And unfortunately, one hears somewhat similar uh, rhetoric from the Chinese side. My message to both sides is you really do not want to replay the Cuban Missile Crisis over Taiwan. Nobody would benefit from such a risky uh, escalation. Far more important, I think, at this point, to seek a new era of detente uh, and to revive the kind of communications, the kind of strategic dialogue that the US and China used to have. Let me add one more point. It's come as a great surprise to many people, including, I think, in China, that Joe Biden's administration has in some ways been more uh, uh, combative towards China than President Donald Trump's. 
Trump was interested in a trade war. He wasn't really interested in any other kind of war. And my sense is that if he'd been re-elected, we would probably have seen negotiations about the tariffs by now. Ironically, Joe Biden ran against Trump, partly arguing that he would be tougher on China than Trump. And he's followed through since being inaugurated by pursuing a policy that I think authentically is tougher. Why the Democratic uh, Party wants to persist with Donald Trump's tariffs has never been clear to me because they opposed them at the time that they were being imposed. So there's something a little odd here about the way in which the US administration is proceeding. And considering the inflation problem that the Biden administration faces, it would seem to me perfectly obvious that a smart step in the right direction would be to start discussing how to reduce the tariffs and bring to an end a trade war that it must be said did not achieve terribly much, even in its own terms. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely, uh, uh, Neil. I actually, uh, so you gave a very good uh, uh, analysis about this uh, this Cold War uh, uh, danger that uh, we've been seeing uh, uh, more and more now. And uh, you're right. I mean, uh, we've. I mean, many people in China felt that uh, when President Biden comes up, and maybe we should have a little relax, since he has a, he's an old friend of President Xi, and uh, the time, the many <laughs> meals and meetings they had uh, together. Uh, he understands China and, and and also all the all the previous uh, visits he's been uh, quite a number of times. But but at, at the end, you know, it seem, seems that uh, was not the case. I mean, he's even more uh, systematically uh, uh, containing China and also uh, in coach China and 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 in circle China and things like that. So so that that really made uh, made people wondering what what what's going on. And you you mentioned about this history. You know his historical lessons. I mean, uh, we probably really should visit the wisdom of uh, Dr. Kissinger, President Nixon. Uh, you're right. This is the 50 years anniversary of uh, Nixon visit to China, and we just you know recently had another uh, televised event about uh, uh, Nixon uh, Kissinger's uh, 99th birthday uh, with Chinese uh, and also American uh, top. Uh, 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 diplomats and, and, and think tankers. So, so, so I think that uh, uh, can we have some realistic uh, view? Because I think China and the US being the number one and number two largest economy in the world has a moral responsibility. Uh, I've been discussing with uh, uh, Graham Allison a few times on, on similar dialogue and, and Joseph Nye and, uh, and you know, uh, many of Larry Summers. I mean, they all felt we shouldn't have a, a cold one. Nobody wants to come. You know, they were saying, you know, yeah, we have a, you know, competition. We have also cooperation. That's competition, or, or, or co cooperative rivalry. Use uh, Graham's word. So, so can we, you, you know, China, U.S. Can we really get into that kind of situation? Uh, because you mentioned about Chairman a few years ago. That was a, you know, very popular name. Uh, you know, 300 million migrant workers married uh, with 300 million consumers in the U.S. Let's, you know, put this, uh, you know, intertwined, uh, 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 you know, ecosystem that really seems to, you know, carry it on forever. But then, unfortunately, things starting to change. So how can we really get back? Because the world is really facing all the difficulties, dangers. We're probably going to have a famine with all the food prices going up. And... Uh, China's energy is 70% dependent on the import. I mean, with this oil price at all time high. So uh, we really want to see China and, and US uh, uh, get, get along, uh, manageable, you know, uh, admit their differences. There's, there's some problems, and let's, let's face it, you know, but we shouldn't go to the extreme of, uh, of really, uh, I'm going to contain everywhere, or I'm going to, uh, you know, every, you know, drive up the military budget of all the countries uh, in, in the region and everywhere. So that's that's really concerning because given uh, how how dangerous, how vulnerable the world we are facing now, we can't afford the U.S. and China not to work together. You are the historian; <laughs> you know China U.S. so well. Uh, you know, need to su subscribe something for for us. <laughs> I'd like to hear from you as well. Well, I think one of the key lessons of detente is that uh, it takes two to tango. Both uh, sides need to be ready uh, to make concessions or, or it's simply not going to be meaningful. 
uh, by the uh, late 1960s and early 1970s, uh, the cost of the arms race was becoming a major problem uh, for both sides. And indeed, it was a heavier burden for the Soviet Union with its relatively smaller economy. I, I think the United States and China uh, each uh, need to look uh, long and hard in the mirror and ask, what exactly is it that we're trying to achieve here? I've already said why I think it's strange for the Biden administration to pursue such a hawkish policy towards China, particularly since part of it originated with the previous administration. I think at the same time, Xi Jinping and his colleagues in Beijing need to ask whether wolf warrior diplomacy was really the way to go in communicating China's uh, views to the rest of the world. In my most recent book, Doom, I argued that uh, much that Chinese diplomats uh, said and did in 2020 was deeply unhelpful uh, to China itself by alienating European and other countries. The tone of Chinese diplomacy became uh, rather shrill in recent years, and I don't think that that was uh, helpful. I think uh, to, to state uh, too uh, forthrightly ambitions uh, of geopolitical uh, parity, uh, if not dominance, helps in no way because this only arouses uh, the suspicions uh, of Americans and others uh, that China's aspiring uh, to world domination. I don't think that uh, that that is the goal of the Chinese people, but it sometimes sounds like the goal uh, of the Chinese government. There won't be an era of detente unless uh, both sides dial back uh, the rhetoric, dial back the slogans that we currently hear. Uh, as you suggested, they have all kinds of reasons to cooperate. Most people talk about climate change in this context, but that's only one of many things uh, that the US and China need to cooperate over. Uh, public health, we touched on earlier, one of the reasons that US-Chinese relations have deteriorated is mutual mistrust over the question of the origins of the COVID pandemic. And then we have the big economic questions. The less globalization, the more decoupling, the bigger the inflation problem. Uh, and nobody really wins from a world in which we drive inflation up towards double digits. You mentioned, Henry, the danger of famine in large parts of Africa as a result of the disruption caused uh, by the war in Ukraine and, and the sanctions. Uh, it's in, in no way in the interests of the United States and China for the poorest part of the world uh, to descend into the kind of uh, instability that we've seen in the past. So it seems to me that there are eminent practical reasons why uh, Washington and Beijing uh, should be talking more uh, and the first step, I think, is to try to put aside the Cold War rhetoric uh, and learn the language of detente again. Uh, and that's one reason that I'm motivated to write uh, the second volume of my Henry Kissinger biography, to remind people that detente was not a naive policy. It was not that uh, Richard Nixon deeply trusted and loved Leonid Brezhnev, nor for that matter did Henry Kissinger regard Cho and Lai as his best friend. These uh, relationships were based uh, on an understanding of mutual interest. Uh, and I think that should be the basis of a, of a new era of detente. As I said, it must be preferable for the two sides to talk about their common interests than for them to use uh, high flown rhetoric and armaments programs to move us down the road towards uh, a confrontation uh, over Taiwan. And let me remind uh, those listening that when uh, my good friends, uh, Robert Blackwell and Philip Zellico studied the issue of what a conflict over Taiwan would look like uh, in a recent paper for the Council on Foreign Relations, one of the obvious points that uh, they made was this would be absolutely economically disastrous, quite apart from the disastrous military damage that would arise. So I think it, it must be the case that both sides need to change uh, their attitudes uh, before we get ourselves back into such a perilous situation as the world found itself in back in 1962 over Cuba. Thanks, uh, uh, Neil. I think that that is really uh, a good advice. You know, let's let's uh, let's, you know, really get together, <laughs> talk about it. 
I think also part of the pandemic has uh, has uh, accelerated the, this kind of isolation, mistrust, and uh, and uh, less communication dialogue. Uh, hopefully, you know, now we're going to have G20 uh, later this year. I heard uh, uh, the Indonesian ambassador mention this morning that uh, you know the G20 will, will probably uh, will have very successful attendance. So we hope that uh, you know this off, uh, you know, uh, this uh, 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 top leaders meeting would uh, would really uh, reach something. And uh, but uh, you're right. I think you know, uh, uh, you know every country has uh, its own views, and uh, sometimes uh, how we can really get this. Uh, third party, international organizations, uh, multilateral system to really, uh, uh, you know, glue things together, glue countries together is really, we need to really upgrade and also reinforce the global system. I mean, the global governance is probably uh, 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 falling uh, apart now. And uh, after, you know, the war and famine and, you know, pandemic and all those uh, uh, crises. So, so the, the Chinese economy is also facing a lot of challenges with the COVID uh, reoccurrence. And the US is uh, having this uh, uh, historical high probably since 90s, the, the inflation uh, stagnation. At, uh, we have so many headaches at, at, at home. Uh, <laughs> that's not really busy with, with all the things uh, outside. And uh, so, so, so before we you know, really uh, think hard on this thing, one of the things I'm wondering all the time is that because China you know, has a different system, China has a 5,000 years history and uh, culture, you know, they, they, have a, they always practice some kind of collectivism. There's, a, there's always seniority, family values, uh, education, uh, hard working and things like that. Whereas I think Western culture, there's a Renaissance, there's individualism, there's, a, you know, all those uh, uh, freedom, you know, has been highly emphasized. So you think that uh, uh, from historical point of view can, can you know, different values, different system, in the end, they can somehow really, uh, com at least co not converge, but at least they, 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 they are peacefully coexisted. I, I was talking to uh, uh, Joseph Nye, he telling me maybe by 2035 or maybe 2040, you know, we'll, we're okay, China is a China. I mean, it's, you know, it's a fact we have to accept. You know, if China is, is lifting 800 million people, uh, representing 70% of global reduction. If China is uh, 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 also contribute over one third of global GDP growth, become the largest trading nation with 130 countries, you know, somehow, you know, even though China have a little different system, can, can the West in the end accept that? And, uh, or maybe we find a way to, you know, uh, recognize each other, uh, not just as a country, but maybe the, the way of life and the way of uh, a government. So, so there's a bit of more, a philosophical question there, uh, you know, maybe to 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 ask you <laughs> in the end. I hope. Well, I think the lesson of the first Cold War is that uh, in order for there to be detente, uh, there has to be a, a kind of mutual tolerance of uh, difference uh, in domestic political institutions. Uh, that there shouldn't be an aspiration on one side to make the entire world. Uh, in its own image. Ultimately, uh, each side thinks it has a superior system or it has the appropriate system uh, for its own conditions. I think that's the starting point for detente. One focuses on the international uh, interests and leaves domestic politics pretty much off the table. The only reason that you end up with uh, arguments about domestic politics, I think, is if uh, one side believes uh, that the other side is engaged in espionage uh, or other activities that in fact uh, intrude into the, uh, the, the domestic uh, politics, into the realm uh, of its adversary. So I think there's a fairly clear uh, way forward. I don't think uh, it's likely that Americans will stop criticizing uh, the ways in which uh, Hong Kong's new national security op uh, law operates or the ways in which the Uyghur uh, population is treated in Xinjiang, I'm sure we'll continue to disagree about the status of Taiwan. Those things, I think, uh, are not going to change. Uh, but it seems to me we could uh, learn from 1972 uh, how to agree to disagree. That was the essence of how uh, Kissinger and Cho Enlai 
dealt with the problem of Taiwan, ushering in half a century of what became known as strategic ambiguity. Uh, it seems to me one of the worst ideas of the last few years uh, in the United States was to get rid of strategic ambiguity. And when Richard Haas first suggested that in 2020, I was quite uh, shocked because it seems to me it's worked pretty well. Uh, why change something that has stood uh, the test of, of five decades? Philosophically, I think each uh, of the two superpowers has a completely different approach to politics, which is historically based. We should accept that each system has its problems. Nobody could pretend that American democracy has worked with perfect smoothness in the last few years, but nor could anybody claim that uh, Chinese, uh, uh, the Chinese Communist Party has done an, an awesome and perfect job of governance in China. Both countries have problems. In the United States, we have uh, the highest inflation since 1982. In China, the lowest growth uh, really since the 1970s. Uh, so uh, I think both sides have reasons to be conscious of their own shortcomings. Nobody can claim to be perfect in this debate. But as I said, the most important thing in foreign relations is not to criticize the domestic politics of the other side. The most important thing is to find common ground on those international, those global issues that are most urgently needing to be addressed. And I've already mentioned uh, the key ones. Normally people put climate change first. Somebody might put public health first. But in my view, the one obvious lesson of the war in Ukraine is that war is the biggest disaster. War is the disaster you want to avoid. That's the thing that shortens life's lives most ruthlessly and causes the worst uh, damage and disruption. So the top priority for US-China relations has to be, face it, we're in a Cold War. Let's make sure it doesn't turn into World War III. And there are some extremely important lessons we can learn from the era of detente in that regard. Yes, that's a great uh, message there. I think Dayton would be really good to, to revisit that, particularly the wisdom uh, of uh, uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger and, and President Nixon, as also we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of Nixon's visit to China. But uh, maybe finally, uh, as, a, as a second uh, a time, you're, you're writing the autobiography for <laughs> Dr. Henry Kissinger. I mean, he's a brilliant uh, figure in, in the 20th and 21st century. I, I, you know, we saw him uh, just celebrate his 99th uh, uh, birthday. Uh, incredible, he's so clear-minded. Perhaps you can tell us a bit about how you go about this book and uh, what can we expect and, and why, why, why is your book coming out and uh, we can do a, a, I'm sure it'll be a bestseller in China uh, uh, by then. And uh, uh, so maybe you can maybe disclose a little bit what, what we are working on and uh, what we can expect. Well, I'm writing it now. I've I've written the introduction in four chapters. That probably means I've got about 16 or uh, or so more chapters to write. So I have a lot of work still to do. I hope very much that I can get the book finished for his uh, centenary, for his 100th birthday uh, next year, uh, and have it published uh, soon after that. Needless to say, this volume contains uh, the critical events that we've been talking about, uh, in particular, uh, the opening to China and Richard Nixon's visit to Beijing in 1972. So I think from the point of view of US-China relations, it really repays uh, a return to the primary sources. I'm working my way through tens of thousands of documents from the period, trying to piece together the origins of the improved relations with uh, between the United States and China. And I'm hoping that the publication of the book will remind people of just why it happened and how important it has been for the United States and China to have uh, a, a relationship, to be in dialogue with one another. Uh, as I said, this is not about naivety. Uh, Dr. Kissinger never pretended, as some people believe, that China would magically turn into a Western-style democracy and understood, he's always understood, uh, the extraordinary power of history in shaping the political differences between nations. I'm hoping, therefore, to get this book out as soon as possible because I think it's urgently needed. We've forgotten in all the upheaval of the pandemic, uh, in the most recent upheaval caused by the war in Ukraine, we've actually forgotten the dangers of Cold War. 
the risk in any Cold War that it becomes a hot war. And that, I think, is the thing that I'm most struck by as I read the documents from the early 1970s. They saw, Dr. Kissinger and his colleagues saw clearly how catastrophic it would be if the US-Soviet relationship escalated into World War III. We've forgotten how catastrophic it would be if the US and China went to war. It would be as catastrophic in terms of the military and economic as well as the human damage that would be caused. So if I can do anything to remind people of how dangerous the downside is, then it will have been worthwhile to write this very lengthy and uh, detailed biography. Thank you, uh, uh, Neil. I think this is going to be a, a great book that uh, we all expect, in, and uh, uh, you're right, uh, the, the wisdom of uh, Dr. Kissinger, and uh, he, he actually, you know, uh, so 50 years, some years ago, come to China and reopened the uh, U.S.-China relation with President Nixon was was this changed the world, <laughs> you know, changed the uh, destination of both countries and to, to that matter, the whole, uh, you know, globally. And uh, so, so I'm, I'm sure that, that your book uh, will be serving as a, a very timely and very <laughs> potent uh, reminder of how the world we are getting to another uh, dangerous phase. And is uh, is the tante is is really absolutely should be revisited and uh, and wisdom of Nixon. Uh, and uh, Dr. Kissinger should be uh, revalued re as well. I mean, we are we are really needing this kind of uh, uh, people that still alive today has witnessed uh, both century and has written so many things happening. And you are you know doing such a great job in summarizing, analyzing, and also looking at history and predict the future. So we really appreciate you taking the time to, to talk to us, and I'm sure we we're, we're going to. Uh, get a lot of uh, food for thought out of your uh, great talk with us. So, so, so Neil, I really appreciate you taking the time. We had a little technical uh, problem at the beginning, but I apologize for that. But we had a had a very busy day. You know, today we had uh, uh, Henry Pulse in the morning. We had a uh, twenty ambassador come to the to the to the CCG uh, meeting room, and we have another China European Business uh, uh, Council uh, China EU Business Roundtable this afternoon. Right before we start, so. There's a bit of a catch up, but, uh, but I'm really glad that we really uh, worked out. And uh, so uh, uh, I'm uh, Henry uh, Hui Yao Wang, the founder and president of Center for China Globalization. I really appreciate the new uh, speaking with us. We actually talked, uh, I was at London uh, quite a number of years ago. We were at uh, the same panel. You were just flying from US with your jet lag. But we, I remember well, we, we shared the same stage. Uh, with a, a British think tank, so that was really great. Uh, so, so any last last word, and we 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 will close uh, after your final word. Very briefly, Henry, I think it's extremely important that we have conversations like this, and that through the unofficial uh, channels of academia, uh, we have a discussion about where the U.S.-China relationship goes from here. It seemed to me that in the last few years, there's been more and more conversation within the United States about China or within China about the United States. In the end, we need to talk across the Pacific. We need to talk in ways like this. And I hope very much that uh, it won't be too long before we can get off uh, Zoom and be once again in the same uh, in the same room as one another, whether uh, in Beijing or somewhere in the United States. It's been a pleasure to have this conversation with you. It's an important one. And uh, I congratulate you on pulling together uh, such a, uh, an impressive program uh, for, for this event. Thank you for making me part of it. And I look forward to our next encounter, hopefully in, in real space as well as real time. Yeah, yeah thank you. We, we really hope to uh, uh, welcome you here in, in China, in CCG. I, I hope that when G20 leaders starting to travel around, I mean, the whole world can be uh, lifted from quarantine probably uh, uh, of some degree so so that day will come soon i i really hope and I really appreciate your time and uh, look forward to see you again uh, in beijing thank you neil i also thank you very much for our audience uh, our, 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 you know, participant of the conference thank you very much okay i'll see you next time thank you